Okay, uh, continuing our discussion of solutions here. Um, what I have on the page here is a list of what are called solubility rules. Um, so as I mentioned in the last video, some uh, salts, or salts is just a generic term for ionic compounds with a cation and an anion, or cations and anions. Um, some salts are soluble um, in water. Um, but some salts are what we would say are insoluble in water. They do not dissolve in water. And we want to be able to separate out which ones are going to dissolve or be soluble, which ones are going to not dissolve or be insoluble. Now, another description of insoluble, particularly over the course of a chemical reaction, is precipitation or precipitate. So if we do, we mix chemical, uh, some solutions together and a solid forms, we often call that solid a precipitate um, or a precipitate because solids usually are denser than water and they tend to kind of fall toward the bottom of the solution. So the solubility rules will help us identify which combinations of cations and anions are going to be soluble, which combinations are going to be insoluble. Now, when we get on to the next page, we'll see how we're going to try to apply this in terms of evaluating reactions. But let me just go through this real quick. Um, you'll also find a similar set of information in your textbook. Um, and sometimes there's a slight difference in terms of a, an ion will be left out or a different ion will be included. Um, we are going to be using this main set here. If there's a little difference in the textbook, um, I'll try to account for it in any problem that we have. But I think this would be a good place to start if you're working on some problems or, or studying here. So any salt where the cation is lithium, sodium, potassium, right? In fact, this is the first column of the periodic table. So this would apply to rubidium, cesium, and francium as well. Um, they're just not particularly used very often in, in a laboratory setting. But lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, any first column uh, metal ion, or ammonium, our polyatomic ion cation we've talked about, any salt with those cations is always going to be soluble. It's going to dissolve in water. Um, in terms of anions, any salt where the anion is nitrate, chlorate, perchlorate, or acetate, are also always going to be soluble in water. It right? doesn't matter what the cation is, if those are the anions. Right now, things get a little more complicated from here. Um, salts of chloride, bromide, iodide, they are usually soluble, but here in parentheses we've got some exceptions. The exceptions are silver, this is mercury 1, and lead. So there's two mercuries with a plus two overall charge, so that would be described as mercury one. So a chloride salt with silver, so AgCl, that's not going to be soluble in water. That would remain um, designated as a solid on our uh, balanced equation. Or if it's the product, we would it would still be designated as a solid, but we might call it the precipitate that formed over the course of the reaction. Okay. Um, same is true for bromide and iodide. Right. So. Insoluble with silver, insoluble with mercury 1, insoluble with lead 2, soluble with any other cation. Right? Salts of fluoride are soluble generally. With the exceptions here, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, those are your column 2 metals um, other than beryllium. Um, and lead 2 here again as well. Salts of sulfates are generally soluble. Exceptions here, calcium, strontium, barium. So those are the larger, right, further down cations in group two. Right? Notice magnesium was left out there. Um, and also lead two. So for some of these, the exceptions become the important things to keep in mind because they will um, give us some information about where we're likely to see a solid. Okay, now moving to uh, anions that are generally insoluble. Most salts of carbonates, phosphates, chromates, and sulfides are insoluble. They will not dissolve in water. We'd list them as a solid. The exceptions really go back to the first rule. Um, salts of ammonia um, and alkali metals. Alkali metals is a term that's used to describe metals in the first column. That would be your lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Okay, so those are usually insoluble. Most metal hydroxides and oxides are insoluble. 
right? Exceptions here are alkali metals, so again, lithium, sodium, potassium, right? And barium hydroxide. So barium is really large. It doesn't make a very strong connection to hydroxide, so it tends to break up in water. Okay, so this is going to be helpful for us to refer to. So let me keep that close by. Let's start on, on the next page. So here's what we want to do. We want to use the solubility rules to predict um, the reaction products. And then we also want to write a couple different types of equations out here. So let me try just this first one. And the first, you know, the reactants are listed here. And this type of equation is called a molecular equation um, because we have everything written out as if it's a molecule what we are going to do to evaluate this reaction is we're going to write a different form of this equation called the total ionic equation and that's going to come right below the molecular equation here um, on the paper and then we're going to use the total ionic equation to derive another equation called the net ionic equation, which is, is also helpful for evaluating what's going on here. So what I want to do first, right, I've got my molecular formulas up here. I've got lead nitrate, it's uh, soluble, or aqueous there in the equation. Potassium chromate, that's also soluble. But what I want to start to think about, if those are soluble, what ions are present in my solution? So what I want to do is break those formulas up into their constituent ions, and I want to write that out as an equation. Now, you have to be really precise and careful here. Every species should have the correct charge. It should be written the correct way. It should have the correct phase indicator after it. If it's soluble, it should be AQ. If it's a solid, it should be S. If it's a liquid, it should be L. If it's a gas, it should be G, etc. Every little piece of information is important in correctly describing what's going on in this equation. Now, PbNO32, that's two nitrates. We know nitrate has a minus one charge. This is lead two. So in my total ionic equation, I would have a lead cation. It's got a plus two charge. That is aqueous. Right? Now, the polyatomic ions, they're going to stay as nitrates in solution, but they will be floating separately in this solution. So that would be two nitrate ions. Nitrate has a minus one charge, so I need to make sure I've got that charge on there too if I'm indicating the ions that are going on here. Right? And the two's got to come out in front. Two nitrates. Right? No longer would it be subscripted because it's not a molecule anymore. Potassium chromate. Potassium cations will have a plus one charge. There's two of them there, so when this dissolves, they are going to separate and float away from each other. So there would be two potassium cations. AQ dissolved in the solution. Chromate, though, that's a polyatomic ion, so that's going to stay together as chromate, but I do need to put the correct charge in there of two minus, and that would be aqueous. Okay, so that would be the reactant side of my total ionic equation. Now, I say it's useful to do start the ionic equation first because what we want to think about now is predicting the products of this particular reaction. So lead was soluble with nitrate, and that makes sense because nitrate salts are always soluble. But when these two solutions are mixed together, the lead cation now could interact with the other particles in there. Now, Lead cation doesn't want anything to do with potassium cation. You can't make a salt out of two cations because the charge would not balance out. But we want to consider what will happen if lead can react with chromate. Will they form a soluble combination or an insoluble combination? If they're insoluble, they're going to form a solid. Right? So if we look at the solubility rules, one of the solubility rules said most salts of chromates are insoluble. The only exceptions were alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium. Well, lead is not an exception there. So one of the products of our reaction is going to be lead chromate, and it is going to be a solid. Now, we have to write it correctly here. You have to take into account the charges of the ions that you are evaluating here in the reaction. Um, and make sure you get the correct formula for that solid, right? So all this stuff we talked about in chapter two, polyatomic ions, ionic compounds, super important here, because if you can't get the right formula here, you don't have the right reaction or the right description of what's going on. 
Okay, the lead and the chromate react. There's still potassium and nitrate in this solution um, floating around. We should consider, will they react with each other, right? The leftover cation and the leftover anion. Well, if we look at the rules, potassium salts are always soluble, nitrate salts are always soluble. They are going to stay dissolved. They are not going to form a solid. And that means they will be the same over here on the product side of our total ionic equation. So there'll be two nitrate ions floating around aqueous and two potassium cations floating around aqueous. Okay, video's gotten a little long. We'll stop there. We'll pick up in the middle of working out this set of equations in the next video.